This is Yesterzine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. We take a magazine from the golden age, play the games they like most and least, and flip through to find out what gaming was like when most of what you played was just what someone else chose for you every month. Oh yeah. But in this case, what you played as a kid was what they put on a magazine cover disc. And as we celebrate the holy month of Omega, the discs we're interested in were sellotaped to the front of the One Amiga. Issue 51, December 1992. 1992 was coming to a close, and the One were going bold with the best discs ever. And that is not a claim this show is going to leave untested. We'll be going through those discs with fine-toothed sarcasm. But there are still reviews. The Gaming Heaven is a mostly forgotten RPG that's a lot more important than you probably think it is. And The Gaming Hell seems to have wandered in from a magazine ten years older than this one. But if we simply dismissed games for being old, this would be a much easier show to write. We'd probably have time to go on a nice city break. After last month's Death of the Dreamcast, we're joining a machine in its prime here. This is a hugely packed issue of The One with a massive review list. There's reviews of cover disc stars McDonald's Land and No Second Prize, both all-time leaders in their genres. But in addition new this month was Tengen's arcade game Rampart, top movie license Lethal Weapon from Ocean, well-regarded strategy classic campaign, Japanese classic platformer Bonk aka PC Kid aka BC Kid, Nigel Mansell's World Championship, the first in the long-running Premier Manager series, Virgin's Flight Sim Reach for the Skies, and one of my personal Amiga favourites, Bill's Tomato Game, a charming puzzle game from Lemmings publisher Psygnosis. But none of these famous games are our top scorer. I hadn't heard of the game that was, and I suspect maybe neither have a lot of you unless you really know your RPGs, because it's US Gold's Legends of Valor. Chances are you won't even know the developer, conversion specialist Synthetic Dimensions either. Even under their previous name, Dimension Creative Designs, where their one enduring legacy is Corporation alongside Core Design and Virgin. The impressive early 3D of Corporation is the clue though, because Legends of Valor is an early attempt at the kind of thing that would these days have an Elder Scrolls badge on. It's a 3D RPG set entirely within the town of Mitteldorf. Despite its name, German fans of the show will be surprised to find out it's a really big town. With a mile square above ground and nearly 40 miles of underground tunnels containing a huge number of characters. It's also opaque at first. The game menu contains no useful text and it takes me quite a while to start, whereupon we immediately meet this lovely gentleman who tells us to go to the local pub. For the time this 3D is astonishing. There's a really good sense of place in a city that already looks rather nice and moves incredibly well. A bit of poking at that pub tells us our cousin wants us to go to another pub, presumably for some sort of intervention regarding his alcohol problem, but also advertises us the old cheat line. Quite apart from the immersion breaking, making that literally the second thing you see in the game also tells me this is a game where I'm going to need to go back and read a lot more of the manual, not least to try and deal with that epic control panel. Before I do though, I decide to see how much I can see around the town, and it's already a nice place to be. If anything, it's running too quick on this Pi 400 powered hard drive installed copy. I haven't heard any sound either, so I assume something is a little bit broken, given the game credits games legend Ben Dalgleish for at least part of its sound. And then I get arrested for looking suspicious. I have no idea what I did or where I am. Is this a driving while not white simulator or something? It provides a good break to do what Amiga Paz Review says never to do. Play it on an A500 with one disk drive, to at least check what that's like. That's an easy question to answer. It's only a four disk game, but I have to use three of them to get to the main menu and make two more swaps to get to a point where I'm allowed to make any control inputs on a standard A500. I've still heard virtually no sound of any kind until what sounds like a couple of explosions in the distance. I walk forward to go to the pub and have to make another disk swap. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go plug in another three virtual drives and try again. In the meantime, I think I'll have a read of the manual, which might take a while because I have just noticed my zip has seven PDFs in it. The Amiga version has a manual. 
a letter from your cousin, an Amiga Quick reference card that has more words in it than an EA Sports license agreement, and another card essentially entitled Shit We Forgot These Things About The Amiga Version. I discovered I'd missed an entire character creator, but more importantly a map and some excellent scene setting including a very well written manual, including a section which is essentially fantastic beasts and where to be transphobic at them. Although it's not comprehensive, it's missing the entry for your mum for a star. The map too brings home this is a proper open world for the time, a generation before that was especially common, and makes the point you can go into almost every building to find out what's what. This thing is comprehensive. It encourages you to be as well, occasional random arrest notwithstanding, because as the manual even points out, virtually no one is going to try and attack you without a reason. So there's less of the normal open world problems of a Skyrim or even say a Horizon, where half the NPCs in the map will attempt to rip your face off if you so much as look at them. Another place this game pushes the genre is that it works a lot like Fallout 3 survival modes. You have to eat. You have to drink. You have to sleep. And if you don't do these things it's going to be very bad for you. Legends might be a game before its time really, and I think the one in AP spotted that. It's possibly the single most ambitious Amiga game I have ever seen, massively bigger than stuff like Eye of the Beholder for instance. It implements systems that games wouldn't see again for a decade. The bloody thing actually uses primitive ray tracing in places to allow you to see through windows properly. The quest list includes a main story and side quests with various guilds, all of which you tend to find by finding and following clues. The world has named people doing their named things. And this in 2022 is its problem. I'm not going to kid you, I've covered more than 1% of it here. I'm not even going to pretend I'll probably do any more of it. There's too many modern RPGs I've not played that I'd work through first. For instance, right now I'm playing Kingdoms of Amala. But the thing is, there's an astonishing amount these modern games borrow from here. If you're an RPG historian and didn't play this, I feel that would be like not playing Manic Miner for platformers, or liking modern point and click adventures but not playing the first King's Quest. If that's you, you should look. For everyone else, it has the classic problem. Everyone who stole its ideas did so with more time to think and more tech to do thinking for you. The reviews of this varied more than you'd think. The one obviously loved it, and even Amiga Power called it the coming of age for the concept of an Amiga RPG. Amiga Action though, both in their traditional review format and when their RPG specialist looked at it a month later, savaged it. They considered it overwhelming, and I get that, it certainly is for me in 2022. They criticised the price, and at £40 it was at least £10 more than most Amiga games. And they also say an A500 can't handle it. I disagree there. Yes there's a lot of swapping without an external drive, but the actual game appears to run very well despite all of its innovation and scope. If we look at Elder Scrolls Arena, running with a heck of a lot more power behind it on a PC two years later, it's not dramatically more impressive, although the larger screen is welcome of course. It's amazing how much this resembles the Elder Scrolls, and those of you who know the relationship between the years 1992 and 1994 will suspect what's coming next. Legends of Valor was not successful. Despite being titled Episode 1, and while an entire sequel was drafted that would have taken you outside the city, it never happened and the developer would transition to being more of a third party supplier a few years later. It does though have a legacy. This chap is Todd Howard, a producer on Elder Scrolls since the start and director of both Skyrim and Fallout 4. Let's see what he has to say. But some of the games at the time that inspired it, uh, some of them are, are, you know, people don't remember anymore as well, like Darklands from Microprose, uh, Legends of Valor, an SSI game, which uh, where you could, you know, had a very detailed town. The whole game, I think, was in a town. Um, is really good. Ultima Underworld. So yes, this is a pake. It's difficult. It's massive, and understandably, with so many newer RPGs that are prettier and friendlier, you may well want to play those instead. I've already confessed I will. But if you're an Elder Scrolls fanboy, especially if you fondly remember the older ones, 
then this might be the nearest thing you'll ever play to a new one, unless you live long enough to see the release of Elder Scrolls 6 in another four console generations time. And in any case, there's hope. In 2020, Charles Hoskinson bought the rights and announced he wanted to develop a remake. Of course, he's a blockchain pyramid scheme weenie who also falsely claimed to be doing a PhD course that literally didn't exist at the University of Denver, so don't hold your breath. But having built idiot ape enthusiasts for nearly half a billion, if he wants to make it happen, it'll happen. The cover tape wars were fierce, and arguably ultimately to the detriment of the 8-bit software market. At their height, the likes of your Sinclair were putting seven or even eight things on their cover, and the majority of them were full games. Take this classic era your Sinclair from August 1991. Your £1.95, 4p less than even the most wallet-friendly new game, gets you a magazine with a tape attached. That tape has no less than six complete games on it. And it's not a bunch of filler crap either. The lead is Activision's Port of Tempest, which while four years old was full price on release and got a healthy 7 out of 10 from this very magazine. Ripped Off is Repton. Very clever. While this version is a reader game that appeared on a YS compilation years earlier, it is still a serviceable version of a proper arcade game, and this one even had a level editor. Star Raiders 2 is another Activision game, another full price game, and an 8 out of 10 review in your Sinclair. Train Game Southern Bell has been on my list to look at for a very long time, being the predecessor of the train sim craze of modern times. We've not the time now, but it got marks as high as 84% in Crash and 4 out of 5 in Sinclair User as a near full price game. You are, I imagine, getting the idea. The final two games, also provided by Southern Bell Publishers Hewson, are Alien Syndrome style shoot 'em up Crawl and Super Cup Football which had originally appeared as two of four games in a £13 compilation just a year earlier, two admittedly muted reviews. But however you slice it, for literally less than the cheapest retail spectrum games, you're being given six at least budget quality games, averaging somewhere around pretty good, and including decent conversions of two arcade machines. So the problem, as you might be rapidly realising is, if people are getting a game and a half a week pretty much just for existing, who is actually buying games? As a kid who could probably afford or beg a couple of quid, six games is getting you through a month easy. And if it didn't, might I tempt you to a very similar price for the four games on the front of Crash, or the five on the front of Sinclair User? That's a total outlay of £6 for 15 games. Buying just the two highest rated games in this issue of your Sinclair would have cost you nearly three times that. The publishers rebelled, and about this time agreed to not sell full games to 16-bit magazines, including the Amiga ones. So while this remained massively important to magazine sales, demos and free public domain games were the order of the day. So what are the one doing to justify such a lofty claim? Well, it's five demos, and the lineup is promising. Street Fighter 2, Mario contending platformer McDonald's Land, no introduction needed sensible soccer, the Amiga's best motorbike game, no second prize, and puzzle platformer Creatures. If you've managed to find your way to YouTube, I probably don't need to explain the home conversion significance of Street Fighter 2, the arcade hit of the early 90s with its huge sprites, big colours and a fighting system, accessible yes, but with enough depth the arcade machine has six buttons. In 1992, the prospect of a conversion, arcade perfect to all intents and purposes, appearing on the new Super Nintendo sold millions of the buggers on launch, and if I switch over to my US SNES copy, you'd agree it delivered. The SNES could do it. The SNES controller even had the required six buttons, albeit differently arranged. People went mad. 30 years ago, they were importing SNES Entertainment Systems for PS5 prices, and paying £70 for copies of the cart. And here's the thing. 
most of them didn't regret it. And to be fair, even at 50p a go in those days, most of them absolutely got their 70 quid's worth. It wouldn't remain exclusive though. A mere nine months after the SNE system was released in the UK, then huzzah! US Gold were bringing Street Fighter 2 to the MIGI. It'd be on four discs, and in sharp contrast to the Nintendo One, it would be under 30 monies. There were issues though. As you can see from the One's demo, the colours are off. The frame rate isn't quite there. The biggest issue though is most Amiga controllers are one button. What effect this has on the gameplay would be quite interesting. But unfortunately, it would also be beyond the scope of this feature. No one who bought the one this month would be any the wiser because you can't play it. Yes, this is a rolling demo, but what it is not is a video. I tried it a few times and while the fight is always between Red Ken and White Ken on Electric Honda's stage, it doesn't always quite play out the same way. Not sure that's a huge draw though, unless you intend to have the dullest gambling evening in recorded history. Still, it'll be lovely to see how the Amiga replicates that lovely arcade music. Or it would, because there's no sound either. Not a great start for the bestest ever. A big ask for our second game too, McDonald's Land, a game that should be more famous in Europe than it is. If Zool was the Amiga's big hope at having a Sonic, so McDonald's Land was probably its greatest hope of this period for doing something to rival Super Mario Bros. The thing is, I don't want to prejudge it, but there's a big problem with using this game as your big hope to beat Super Mario Bros. Specifically, that it's already a NES game under the name MC Kids. Total gave Super Mario 3 98%. They gave MC Kids 77%. These days, I'd suggest very few people remember it in comparison to its not quite a sequel Global Gladiators. The story here is that Ronald's magic bag has been swiped and he knows who took it. He also knows where they've gone, but he won't do anything about it himself, or even let you do anything about it unless you explore this world and find four of his puzzle cards. The first mystery of this game is why your player doesn't immediately tell Ronald to burger off. It's at this point you discover just how much McDonald's Land wants to be Mario Bros. 3. Spoiler. It's a hell of a lot. This map screen is about three musical notes from being legally actionable. It's a lovely little tune though. The gameplay is quite a bit different. There's no costumes here, but blocks which can be thrown at enemies and occasionally have other uses, such as filling in these blank spaces to create new platforms. As a game that uses up to jump, it was pretty awkward at first, so if you're on an emulator as I am for these demos, I suggest you cheat like I did, and mapping up to another button on my Sega Saturn joypad makes this immediately about 5,000 times more playable. It's a decent sized demo this. You've got the whole first world and all these levels representing a full sixth of the game, and it's all here. We're not quite here to review the game, but suffice to say of course this is about as comparable to Mario Bros as Zool is to Sonic, but it does have its own charm. Forcing you to explore the levels and make use of the terrain, such as that spinner block, is something Mario didn't really have, and the designs are often pretty interesting. The music continues to be considerably more varied than you'd expect for a half disc demo of a game that runs quite happily on an unexpanded Amiga 500. I also appreciate it doesn't ask you to collect every single possible puzzle piece to progress, especially because I found five of the six in this world and I can't remember what level it is I've missed one in. Still, you're able to play this entire first world, and that's exactly what you get, because on my admittedly fake A500 here, it hangs the second you take the cards back to Ronald. That said, I'm going to come back to this, not least because I seem to have acquired that NES cartridge at some point. It's not Mario. Of course it's not Mario, but it is interesting. The one gives it 90%, but I think that just tells you the Amiga needed this. The 77% from total? That's probably about right. Sensible Soccer is more interesting, because even at the end of 1992, it's not a new game. Sensible Soccer had been released five months earlier, getting a 93% from the one, and the review conclusion 
Every other football game is redundant as of now. Which is a little unfortunate given that there was a demo of noted other football game, Striker, on the cover of that very issue. Speaking from the perspective of 1992 though, he is absolutely 100% right, and you can shut up about kickoff right now. Still though, what's with this demo nearly half a year later, and why does that make it one fifth of the best cover disc ever? The answer is to be found in the news section, because it's easy to forget now that while excellent and fully deserving of its score, the original Sensible Soccer wasn't perfect on release, or, if you're unkind, even finished. This is true to the extent that for Christmas 1992, publishers Renegade released a version 1.1 of the game to shops and an upgrade disc for former purchasers. This fixes a surprising number of fundamental problems with the original game. Goalies, for instance, were a mess who couldn't catch balls and fluff some very easy shots. There was no back pass rule, and there were no red and yellow cards, all of which should make this the definitive version of Sensi, and they were so confident that it's a demo of 1.1 that graces this cover disc. The intro screen also touts these improvements, and while I've always controversially considered the Mega Drive 1 to be the definitive version of the original Sensible Soccer, I'm not sure I can say hand on heart that I've played 1.1, so I'm looking forward to this grudge match between Lazio and Sheffield Wednesday apparently. We are Wednesday, and the game begins with so far, so sensey. It's still just excellent though, although I'm again going to waver that MD one with its slightly better scrolling and friendly controls. I am though settling in like an old friend, remembering how the deceptively simple sensey allows you to do passes, through balls, get intercepted, and finally after a minute or two I spot a chance as the opposition plays a high line and send my midfielder through with a piercing run that my striker toe pokes home to take a deserved 1-0 lead. And the game quits. Yes, this is a one goal demo, and that is amazingly tight and near useless for evaluating a football game. You would think Sensible Soccer would be a shoe in for a greatest Amiga cover disc, but not letting you have even a full half is incredibly poor. We're judging discs, not games here, and in strong contrast to McDonald's Land, a demo that's over in a shorter time than it took to load is not a winner. The game itself? Legendary, on almost any format. Now this is possibly more like it. No second prize, or no second chance as the one briefly calls it, is a bigger demo than Sensible Soccer just from its intro, and like Sensible Soccer, is the nearly undisputed best game of its genre to ever appear on the format. The intro alone makes this point. Plenty to do here too, with racing and training modes at multiple tracks to explore with one, zero, or all the possible opponents as well. The full game's welcome customization options remain too, for both gears and, much more importantly, mouse sensitivity. And this is a fully mouse-controlled game, which makes perfect sense. Move the mouse to lean left and right with accelerate and brake on your two buttons. It works very well, and none of my problems with the game are to do with the control scheme. I say this is the best of its genre on Amiga, and while I stand behind that, the only real competition comes from an ancient conversion of Super Hang On that you would not want to play on this format anyway, and from Red Zone, which we saw right back in Episode 1, and which just isn't as slick on stock hardware. The main reason I don't offer sensible soccer level praise for this game is it makes two bizarre decisions, one of which is in this demo. Drone Bikes. Drone Bikes everywhere. Even if you turn off all opponents in training mode, there are drone bikes getting in your way and meaning you simply don't get to train. If you're going for a lap time, you'll get one right where you want to be turning in. If you're racing other bikes, those will magically avoid them, but you won't. And if you tap a bike of either drone or competitor form, they won't move at all, but you'll slide to a stop before you can get going again. It's a mad decision and leaves you with a non-arcade game that acts like an unfair arcade game. It doesn't have the physics for arcade lovers, but anyone who actually wants to race is going to find that drone behaviour exhausting and irritating, 
especially once you graduate to the full game and find obstacles strewn over the track in places for some reason. Again, only really affecting you. Still though, when NSP clicks, it clicks. I could have spent hours time trialling this one if not for those drone bites, and I don't mean age 12, I mean now. As a demo with multiple tracks, all the riders and a proper race mode, this is a stonker. Creatures claims to be a bonus game, but exactly what that's supposed to mean I have absolutely no idea. It appears neither on the front of the magazine, nor in the disc pages. Does that mean it's not supposed to count towards the best discs ever? Or is the presence of an extra freebie on your disc of freebies supposed to be a reason they're the best ever? Nonetheless, it's on the disc, even as an even freer B, so we're damn well going to play it. Although not without trepidation. It would get 69% a few issues later, and Amiga Power would give it just 20, although experienced Yesterzine viewers have already guessed the reviewer there and made certain probably correct assumptions. Creatures, though, comes to us from the Commodore 64, where it saw marks as high as 96% from Zap. But of course, that was two years earlier, less than half the price, and with less competition. If we were doing that issue of Amiga Power today, we'd be doing a full review, because that 20% is the lowest scorer by a staggering 58%, behind, ironically, Zool. And if we were doing that, then we'd have to compare the two versions to find out what the crap is going on here. But, since we're just looking at the discs, let's just see if this demo is fun for the time it lasts. So what we have here isn't really the game. It's one of the sections that occurs between levels where you have to puzzle your way to figuring out how to save one of your friends. And it's confusing as heck, to be honest. I actually have the right idea pretty much already. I need to get up there and push the rock onto the seesaw with the cannonball. What I miss because of the lack of instructions is that I also have a secret fireball attack by holding down on the fire button used to light the cannon first. And also that you can actually get up on the right despite it looking like you should do so on the left. The controls are so unbelievably awful that I only figured that out from the second walkthrough I read that explains further than the phrase, get up to the top. Even so, it's a speedrun, and on this attempt where I finally do that, there's graphical glitches, and despite solving the puzzle, the game fails me. I don't know creatures, I've still not played a proper level of it, but I'm going with AP on this one. Controls are so awful that even a normal platform level is going to be pain incarnate. And if on one screen they've made the correct route look like the wrong one, and the incorrect route feel like it should have worked, that does not bode well for their level design skills when even level 1 takes our walkthrough host a full 10 minutes to battle through. No. So best discs? It feels a bit unlikely. No second prize is pretty successful. McDonald Land is a pretty nice demo of a slightly flawed game. But Sensible Soccer is essentially unusable, although to be fair it's also identical to all the other magazine's demos of the game. Street Fighter 2 is also worth ignoring in this context, serving only to tell you it looks like crap compared to the one your SNES only mates were playing. And I'm going to go back to pretending creatures never existed. If you watch the Gouldfish's excellent series on the cover disc wars, then you'll have seen many many better months than this for demo discs. We're 10 years into what most in the UK would recognisably call video games here. Maybe 5 years earlier than that the Pong consoles from Binatone and their friends were in stores, and the Atari 2600 was a thing by 1980. But really it's the early 80s releases of the Spectrum, CPC, C64 and the 8-bit consoles is where home gaming was properly a thing. 10 years, I'd say, is just about enough time for the concept of retro to be valid. Three years from now, CVG would be the first to have a regular retro section. But games were already getting spruced up remasters and reinterpreted versions for the modern age. You might have seen Space Invaders 91, for example, which on Amiga at least took all the fun of Space Invaders and made it slower. What I'm getting towards here is we've got another example. Breakout, the classic bat and ball game, is two years older than even Space Invaders. It's simpler too, being literally the hitting a ball against your garage version of Pong's tennis. If the bricks in your garage disappeared when a tennis ball hit it anyway. 
1979, Blockbuster, essentially a version of Breakout, was the world's first handheld cartridge game, being packaged with the MB Microvision. Before Tetris came along, Alleyway was the game that filled that slot in the Game Boy's initial launch, advancing the concept with the power-up system I believe first used in Taito's Arkanoid from 1986. The Amiga is one of the few contemporary machines that didn't see a port of that, but it won't surprise you to know every amateur software writer had produced one at some point. My favourite on the Amiga is superb public domain game Mega Ball, an entirely free game you'll find on the third Assassin's compilation. Which means Silmarils are being really rather brave by releasing a Breakout clone for 26 actual monies in 1992. If the name Silmarils is familiar, that's going to be for one of two reasons. Firstly, yes, it's a J.R.R. Tolkien reference somehow both after and before that was the trendy thing to do. But most notably, for game players, you may remember the Ishar trilogy of relatively generic but popular RPG games. Excellently, Wikipedia says development of a fourth for the Atari Jaguar CD was discontinued for Unknown reasons. Unknown reasons, I suspect, which are very similar to the reasons for the discontinuation of plans for a chocolate teapot factory in the Sahara Desert. So what does Bunny Bricks, no really that's its name, offer us? Well the short version is, it makes things more complicated. Firstly, the one advantage of a breakout game on computer rather than console is you can use a better control method. A mouse is great. You can move across the screen exactly as fast as you need and position your bat exactly where it needs to be to get the correct angle for the next shot. It's brilliant. It's why Mega Ball is brilliant. So naturally Bunny Bricks doesn't do that, this is a joystick control only game. And before I even start a proper game, let me just show you how well that goes. With tapping versus holding, you can just about construct two methods of traversal. You've got sidestep, and what I can only describe as Panic Mints, with a walking animation apparently consisting of drawing a bunch of frames and then getting the game to play them in a random order. The fact we're even talking walking animations is important because you are no longer some anonymous bat, you are a rabbit holding a baseball bat. An idea so strange in a breakout game, I wonder if this all started with someone at Silmarils misreading their original briefing document and then being too stubborn to admit it for the entire development process. Instead, you have to hit the ball in order to move it, which confused me at first as I couldn't see any way to move said ball other than straight up. Certainly, shuffling one side or the other doesn't do anything, except reveal that you can get hit in the head and lose a ball which also stuns you long enough it's a real effort not to lose a second. What I realised, from a combination of reading the manual and realising I remapped my joypad to play McDonald Land, is that hitting straight up is achieved by pressing up on the joystick, not fire. If you press fire, you also need to press left or right in order to direct the ball. Excellently, the manual has the control scheme reversed, which doesn't help at all. Even so, I really can't see how to properly direct the ball. It's obvious in a traditional breakout game that the very edge of the bat sends it off almost horizontal, a quarter way across left diagonal, and the very centre straight up. With this I don't get the positioning at all, and you end up just moving as little as possible thanks to the awful controls, and just choosing left or right according to whichever direction has the most blocks. It doesn't help that, rather than being a nice open area like in most games like this, there's some oppressive walls sticking out into the area, and a good proportion of the time I'm just hitting the ball off them rather than anywhere that might be in some way useful. It turns the thing into a case of tedious survival, where you're not in control of your own destiny in any meaningful way. Through sheer persistence I beat my way through to level 2, and in doing so get a couple of glimpses of what they're going for. Exactly once, a panic dive across the screen works to retrieve a ball that looks lost, and that was great, although of course a situation that would have never arisen with mouse control. Level 2 is where I meh quit, which is like a rage quit but without actually caring. The level is absurdly restrictive, you can't get to any of that right hand section until you clear the narrow left one, which is itself protected, and even if you did, the opening to the bricks is small. 
This would be difficult in a game with controls, but here, no. And what doesn't help is that if you fail, you can't continue or even restart. You have to load the high score table, then load the title screen, then load the level intro, then load the game. It's well over a minute to have one more go, and nothing will kill an arcade game like that. Except, you know, being awful. On the back page, it's your boy, Jimmy Two Pumps, telling you to ring that bell. Haven't even said anything yet, but ring it anyway. That's how cool my stuff is. Well, no, it's not. It's Super Nin. Sorry, Super Jim Tendo, Earth's most entirely serious YouTuber. Learn how to get extra money by grading your used video games at home, instantly turning them into million dollar auction candidates, assuming you own the auction site, and get one of your mates to fake buy them. Or find out how to be instantly successful on YouTube, although I notice be advertised by the internet's fifth most popular magazine retrospective show is not on the list for some reason. And whisper it, and don't tell him I told you, Little Jimmy actually knows what he's talking about, especially when it comes to the Super Jim <sighs> Nintendo. Videos like 10 awesome SNES games under £10 are genuinely excellent, and not just because I'd already bought most of them. Everybody likes Desert Strike, Jungle Strike, Urban Strike not so much. Here we have got Desert Fighter, uh, one of the last sort of System 3 um, games. They didn't foray that much into Super Nintendo. Um, but it's Desert Strike on sonic speed. You're a jet fighter blowing up things in the gulf. It's the same as Desert Strike, but faster paced. So go subscribe. They're short videos, and what are you going to do otherwise with your three minutes? Download a car? And while you're there, go do all the things with this channel too. It makes YouTube notices, and what will I do without this sweet, sweet validation? probably go into a deep spiral that ends with me playing Rise of the Robots again. And no one needs that. See you next time.